and welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're talking about a hero of the Second World War who you may have seen but not yet know. Since 2016, a gable wall mural on Foxglove Street in East Belfast has borne the depiction of General Sosabowski, commander of the Polish First Independent Parachute Brigade at Arnhem. We are honoured today to be joined by the General's great-grandson, the wonderful Professor Hal Sosabowski. Professor Hal, welcome to the podcast. Uh, I've had the pleasure of hearing you live uh, online and in podcast forums quite a few times now, but uh, some of our listeners may be new to both you and your work. Uh, can you give us a quick introduction to who you are and what we're going to talk about today? Uh, my name is Hal Sosabowski. I'm Professor of Public Understanding of Science at the University of Brighton, which is my day job. But I'm also the great-grandson of Major General um, S. Um, S. F. Sosabowski, um, who led the Poles into Arnhem, and also grandson of his son, uh, Dr. Major S. J. Sosabowski, who's often overlooked in the discussion of Polish war heroes. Unfortunately, we are going to be another one of those groups who sadly overlooks the role of uh, the Major uh, in his role in the Second World War in particular in um, the Warsaw Uprising, um, but later on in the podcast we'll, we'll come back and we'll let people know how they can get in touch with you and how they can keep an eye out on your, on your social media for maybe other talks that you're doing about both the General and the Major. Um, General Sosabowski is best known for his role during the Battle of Arnhem, but his military career predated that by some way. Um, as a younger man, what was his involvement in both the Great War and the interwar period? Well, that's the thing. So um, he was born in 1892 and his father died um, when he was very young. So he, was, he raised up his, he was the man of the house. And um, he took this interest in leadership and uniform service very, very quickly. And he was conscripted into the, Aus the Aus Austrian army and <clears throat> very quickly rose through the ranks. And his first action was indeed um, in that war, in, but it was fighting the Russians in Przemysl, um, which was a very, very bloody conflict. Um, it was a, a castle um, on the side of a mountain which they were defending um, against the Russians. And he was one of those, one of three um, out of 250 who survived that, even though he received um, a relatively serious injury, which required him to be um, uh, uh, convalescing for some period of time. Um, so he went to, um, yes, he got uh, a shrapnel wound to his knee, which took him some years to recover from, um, at which time he went to work for the um, Polish Military Staff College, wrote a couple of books, and sort of honed his military career. So he was, uh, in some regards, an intellectual, um, after which he was the officer in charge of the, uh, the 19th um, Children of Warsaw, which defended, um, it defended Warsaw from the Nazi invasion. So after that Nazi invasion of Poland in September 39, things changed quite dramatically right across Poland. Um, your grand great grandfather was in uh, Warsaw. Uh, what what was his role then in those early stages? Of right. The well, war? He, he he was the officer in charge of the Children of Warsaw Regiment, um, the twenty sorry the twenty first Children of Warsaw Regiment, and there was fierce fighting in uh, the province of Groszow. Um But they, the reality was they were outnumbered and they were outgunned and he was taken um, prisoner. He was sent to Zyrodov prisoner of war camp, uh, where he promptly escaped and via a circuitous route around Europe, ended up back in the UK. Um, his son, who I will slip in just for one sentence, if I may, uh, took a different, ro uh, different role. He went into the Polish underground and remained in Warsaw. So there's a, a contrast between the roles they both played in that early point. And as you said, their events eventually brought um, your great grandfather to the United Kingdom, where he was assigned to Fourth Rifles Brigade. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, about the Rifles Brigade, and about his time in the UK? Right. Well, it was an interesting time because um, effectively three thousand um, soldiers, um, most of them were Polish from the Fourth Polish Infantry, Infantry Division, arrived on the ship, the Abdepool. And um, in the nicest possible way, the British didn't know what to do with them. So they said, here are some colouring books and here are some crayons. Can you go and keep out of the way in Scotland? And what happened there, there were some Polish um, uh, staff officers, uh, General Paszkiewicz and General Maciek. Um, and not that he was a general then, then there was Sosabowski. And what happened was they divvied up um, the available uh, personnel. But of course, General Maciek and General Paszkiewicz, they took 
the officers and the, the fits and the train men. And Sosabowski took what was left. And they didn't have any particular idea of what he'd do with them, only that they would make some sort of fighting force in order to go and liberate Poland in general and Warsaw in particular. And it was called the, the 4th Rifles Brigade, the Canadian Rifles, the 4th Cadre Rifles. The name changed um, as the, um, the, the sort of the landscape changed. And it was only later on that he alighted on the idea of forming a parachute brigade in order to sort of drop into Warsaw and start the liberation. And uh, so, some of those uh, Polish troops were, were quite instrumental in um, sort of developing technique and um, sort of paving the way for, for future airborne operations. Um, I, I heard you talk uh, there last night and, and you told us about some of the training and um, some, some of the influences that the Poles had over, over that with um, the airborne. Um, um, kind of airborne parachute regiments. Um, did they introduce sort of a great change to the, the British way of thinking? Well, one would like to think so, although I, I'm sure the British would disagree. And there was two things. First of all, um, the, the Poles were quartered in a big manor house called Largo House. So they were given accommodation, they were given some supplies, but they weren't given much equipment. So they had to improvise. And Sosab a lot of the soldiers were ex-craftsmen, so Sosabowski got the carpenters to create what we would describe as an assault course but it was to conquer the fear of heights. So it's called the Monkey Grove. It was like a training area that they built themselves. Um, and so they were improvising in particular. But also they took an intellectual interest in parachuting. Um, my great grandfather claims that it was his idea that um, they would form a parachute brigade. It may or may not have been, it may have been a sort of a, a joint venture. But the reality was that there were some expertise in, in parachute doctrines. Uh, Julian Gebolis and Jerzy Gorecki, they were sort of, they were seconded um, and they, they, they looked at the, the actual sort of mechanics of parachuting and they developed it, they developed because there were different doctrines about how you should parachute and there was the, the German way to uh, land on all fours, the British way to uh, use your risers and um, Gebolis found a way of changing the canopy shape by manipulating the shroud lines and developed the, the, the Polish way, whereas the British doctrine was, was to land facing the drift and, and luck would take you where it took you. Um, the German method involved a single riser towards the back, um, but the Poles used risers individually, which gave you more control. And so that became the Polish doctrine, but also the parachute tower. And um, the Poles lay claim to this. The parachute tower was literally like a crane up which you climb and you could take um, an oscillation free jump um, several times per hour which saved the expense and the time of going up in an aeroplane and so they developed the parachute tower and um, they liaised with the parachute training school in Ringway Manchester so it wasn't just oh let's be parachutists but they, they put these doctrines in place and um, the capacity and created a parachute brigade almost out of nothing and there was one thing which the Poles said had to happen um, before you could consider yourself a parachutist. Yes. Let me tell you about this. That So one doesn't want to sound ungrateful. And I suppose if you read On War by von Clausewitz, it says you put your resources where they can be best used. So the Poles didn't get the biggest, the best or the newest. And I think the doctrine then was parachutists jumped out of Dakotas. And so they didn't get Dakotas. What they got was the Whitley bomber. And the Whitley bomber was an interesting beast, um, um, and one of its particular characteristics was it was exceptionally slow. And so if a German anti-aircraft gunner saw a Whitley bomber on the horizon, they could go away, they could have their sausages and sauerkraut, a cigarette, a coffee afterwards, come back, and they could still shoot the Whitley bomber down. It was that slow. But also, um, unlike the Dakota, where you jumped out of the side into the slipstream, with the Whitley you jumped out of the bottom through a hole, which had a circumference not much greater than the parachutist through which it was going. And so you weren't considered a parachutist unless you'd rung the bell. And ringing the bell was when you'd catch your jaw or your teeth on the edge of the bottom of the aircraft, uh, losing a few teeth in the process. I, I will just throw in a, a sentence or two here um, for kind of regular listeners or readers of Wartime NI, um, which just highlights how, um, how slow the Whitley uh, bomber was. Um, that one crashed in East Belfast and 
the velocity of the crash was so that it, it clipped a wing on some trees. It was running out of fuel, making its way back to Sydney Merrifield. Clipped a wing on some trees, spun around 180 degrees and pancaked into the back garden of a terrace house in East Belfast. So um, a, a friend of a friend of wartime and I, Johnny McNee, is keen to investigate that. And usually he investigates crash sites which happen at ridiculously high speeds, high velocity, and you know the the area covers several fields or, or quite a large area. But this is unique in that an entire Whitley bomber came down in the tiny uh, back garden of a house in East Belfast. Um, caused about ten pounds worth of damage, perhaps. It, uh, I, I think it caused very little uh, damage to anywhere in the in the uh, in the neighbourhood, uh, despite the fuel tanks, uh, which were luckily mostly empty, uh, exploding. Um, so we we have um, Sosabovsky in Scotland um, training with um, this this new parachute brigade. Um, hot, uh, their their plan was. Or their dream or aspiration was the the liberation of Warsaw. So how did we get from Scotland not to Warsaw but to Operation Market Garden? Well, the funny thing is that whenever I give my lecture, there's a there's a delightful chap called Mike Russell, very good friend of mine, and he always asks the question: Is could a brigade have liberated Warsaw? And of course, if you sort of take the emotion out of it, the answer is a brigade on its own, two thousand plus men. Probably not. You'd need to have far more than brigade. But it was actually very symbolic. For the young Poles, um, their land being, or their, their capital city and their country being overrun by the Nazis, they, they wanted to try um, anyway. So the idea was, and the, prom- the assurances were, that they'd be trained up to do precisely that. But um, Patton and Montgomery uh, had different ways of finishing the war by Christmas. And... Um, uh, Eisenhower had to resource one or the other. And the reality was that um, of the two, it was Montgomery that was resourced, and Montgomery decided that he wanted a single push into the industrial heartland of the Rhine. And it was Operation Comet was the um, precursor, which didn't happen, but Operation Market Garden was the one that did. And they just needed the resource of the Poles. It's as simple as that. So they were seconded and subordinated to the first airborne. And they were to uh, to land in Arnhem, or in fact, south, north and south of Arnhem, um, whereas the 101st and the 82nd were to capture the bridges leading up to Arnhem. So the thing was, uh, General Sosabowski was, he was a, a soldier's soldier, but orders are orders, and he went along with it. But he also said, I don't think the plan's going to succeed. One of the points he made was, is, is if you think this bridge is so important to the Germans, might it not be that the Germans also know it's important to the Germans? And the, stu- the stunning irony was that um, it was suspected that Patton, uh, so uh, von Rundstedt, the, the German officer in charge, suspected that um, Patton would be resourced. And by astonishing coincidence and irony second to none, sent the 9th and the 10th divisions of the SS Panzers to rest and refit in Arnhem. Um, and that was one of the, the, the very many reasons the, um, the Hohenstaufen and the von Frundsberg were sitting in Arnhem resting and then they got parachuted on. So you had some very, very angry um, German Panzer troops, SS Panzers, who'd have their holiday spoiled. German, German forces relocating uh, to Arnhem mm-hmm. was one of many things which didn't go to plan or some would say went wrong uh, during Operation uh, Market Garden. Uh, we're not going to get into the the, the ifs and, and whys of mm-hmm. the operation. Uh, some would say it was a failure. Some would say it was ninety percent successful. Um, I think one person said that. One person. One, one person said that, and that that one person has uh, been been quoted uh, often on social media. Um, but um, during during the operation, where were the polls, and what what exactly was their involvement? Well, during the first three days, the Poles were sitting around scratching their balls, to be quite honest, because of the fog. They were at Saltby, they were trying to um, take off, but um, they just couldn't because of the fog. And this is one of my great-grandfather's um, objections was, um, the whole notion of a, a parachute operation is the element of surprise. 
once you've dropped your first tranche of paras, the surprise is no longer there. So you, don't, you certainly don't do it over three days, i.e. it's not a purchase by instalment. But lo and behold, I think on day four or day five they started landing, but um, astonishingly drop zone K was overrun, but also astonishingly the equipment was landed north of the river, the poles were landed south of the river. There was also the problem with the radios and consequently the communications from uh, the poles to uh, the first airborne were by um, uh, a Polish uh, liaison officer swimming the Rhine. Unlike in the film of Richard Park, it was a British chap, it wasn't, it was a, a, a pole. Captain Zwolanski, Ludwig Zwolanski, swam the Rhine. And um, just, just with that mention of a bridge too far, I think it's the, the first time we brought it up in the conversation. Um, I recall watching uh, that and many other war movies down at my grandmother's house mm -hmm. as a young boy. Um, General portrayed famously by Gene Hackman. Um, you mentioned one uh, instance there where, where the movie um, played with poetic license and, and changed a, a Polish uh, soldier to a British one. Uh, Second World War movies often get a bit of a bad rap, but what, what are your opinions on uh, A Bridge Too, Too Far and on Hackman and Stosipovsky? Well, in general terms, they had to capture five or six days of um, activities into three hours, so there was some poetic license. Um, so some of the jerk, for example, um, General uh, General Beatrick, um, his subordinate, um, I can't remember what his name was, was a, an amalgamation of uh, Harmel, Harza and one other. And that was quite a wise thing to do. Um, in terms of my great grandfather's character, it was spot on and they did take care to make sure they got it right. He was mercurial, he was very, very direct. and. Um, they took steps to make sure they caught his character properly. They sent researchers to talk to the major, his son, and asked about his mannerisms. And they captured it brilliantly. When he was impatient, he'd often look at the ceiling um, and tut um, impatiently. And I think the two scenes which really captured him beautifully for me was the one when Jeremy Kemp's explaining the drop zone to 12 miles from the objective. And he walks up and says, just checking whose side you are on. Brilliant. And also when a sort of slightly apologetic Den Holm Elliot is trying to explain that fog, it's slippery stuff, you see, it moves. He said, of course it moves. And that was him. Um, his son was equally um, direct, my father's equally direct, and I am too. I suspect there's a, there's a gene somewhere for it, it in our family. It certainly sounds that way. Um, another uh, quote from your great-grandfather, uh, or perhaps misquote famously, was, uh, God bless Montgomery. Um, we we have no objection. Uh, we, we we've no language restrictions on uh, the podcast here. Um, Delighted did, to hear did, it. Did did the general say God bless Montgomery? He did not. No. What happened was, um, and I got this literally first hand from um, Alphonse Machkoviak, who was three places behind it on chalk one hundred when the, the um, general jumped out. He didn't say God bless Montgomery. He said Fuck you, Montgomery, and. Um, I, I'm 99.9% .9 recurring sure that he did that, and I'm delighted that he did. Um, that's what he would have done. Very happy. And so those those tense relations between the British and the Poles at Arnhem didn't certainly didn't disappear or, or dissipate after the event. Um, for many many years afterwards, uh, the Polish involvement was downplayed, denigrated. Um, this is something that's that's slowly changing, um, but how, how should we be going back and, and looking at that? Well, it's changing now. Um, so the fact of the matter is that two, two rather um, unseemly things happened after. First of all, uh, Browning wrote to um, the uh, Polish uh, president in exile, or his CEO, and eventually got to the Polish uh, president in exile saying that my, my grandfather had been obstructive, unable to do his duty, wanted everything done for him. That's bad enough, and that's maybe an opinion thing. And to an extent, my great-grandfather was Eastern European, and Eastern Europeans are direct. They think they're being helpful. They're just giving the information. Whereas perhaps for the British officer class, one has to have this British understatement. You know, I'm terribly sorry, but might it be that we're... And he just didn't get that. Um, he didn't speak particularly good English. Um, and I think he was very much the outsider. But the thing which can't be forgiven is Montgomery saying that the Poles were not keen to fight, especially if it meant putting their own lives at risk. 
and that's a scurrilous slander on young 18-year-old boys who were fighting um, in spite of the fact that they were given the assurance they would be fighting uh, to liberate Warsaw. They went along with a good heart and um, tried to um, uh, liberate Holland. Uh, three figures in terms of uh, deaths, and for Montgomery to say that was A, unnecessary, B, untrue, and it's never been really fixed. It's been fixed by the Dutch for sure, um, and the Polish never forget their heroes. Uh, but the reality is that even the Polish 303 squadron weren't allowed to parade um, after the war because the Russians put pressure on the, both the Dutch and British because after the Yalta um, conference, Poland just wasn't very wholesome anymore. And I think that's beyond upsetting. I mean, my great-grandfather couldn't go back to Poland because he would have been executed. And his adjutant did go back to Poland and was in prison for eight years. So... Um, more, most recently, in 2006, I went to Holland and the, um, the 6th Airborne Brigade of the Polish Army was given the Willems Order uh, but in recognition of their activities in Arnhem. And my great-grandfather was given, given the Bronze Lion, a bit like a George Cross, I suppose. Um, and because um, uh, a young filmmaker uh, wrote a, um, uh, a screenplay for a film that was made called um, The Forgotten Poles at Arnhem and Prince Reinhardt saw this and said, well, this ain't right. They came and they died on our land and we haven't recognised that. I mean, in Poland, he never re needed rehabilitating. He's, he's a hero in his schools. And uh, three years ago, I went to Poland to collect the Order of the White Eagle on my great-grandfather's behalf. But I just do think that the British institution, they don't have to do much. Just say we, we retract the notion that the Poles were cowards because they weren't. Um, British fair play, let's see some of that. And do you, do you think that's something that will change? No. Not at all. If you talk to any para, any, any look, they're absolutely right. They just say it's a, a shocker, but the, the institution won't do that. It's too, it's too long ago, and um, you know, why can't we just forget all about it? But don't forget, the general died. He died in penury. He didn't have a pension, and he ended up um, a storeman in the CAV Electronics in Acton. I mean, someone's got to do that, but I'm not sure a two-star general ought to. But General Maciek ended up as a barman in Edinburgh. That can't be right. And um, I just don't know why, in the scheme of things, that, that's, that was seen to be okay. And um, it wouldn't take much to kind of change that and put it right, would it? No, no, certainly not. Um, across, uh, certainly across the Netherlands and, and Poland, there are now many... Um, many memorials, many things named after the general. Um, some of our listeners may be wondering why we're, we're having this conversation um, today and, and what the general's connection is to Northern Ireland. Um, if you have visited East Belfast, which I know you have, Hal, you, you visited this site yesterday, um, General Sosabowski is now proud of place on a mural to the Polish forces in, uh, on uh, Foxglove Street in East Belfast. Uh, you may or may not know this, but um, how, how, how did the general come to be on that mural or how did that mural come about? I don't know, but I know a man who does. He just walked into the room. Um, I just think that it was, um, there is a, a Polish community in um, Northern Ireland and I suspect, so this is just me as a, as a sort of a, a British person thinking, in terms of murals, you can't have anything more uniting than a kind of nice neutral thing like that. But also I think, as I understand it, there may have been some uneasiness between the Poles and the inhabitants uh, or the, the native inhabitants. And this was a nice way of kind of reconciling those differences. I may be wrong though, I can't remember why I think that but that's perhaps why it was. But um, I went with my host yesterday to look at that mural. I'd seen pictures of it, of course, but up close, it's truly exceptional, the artwork. No, it is a work of art, literally, not just a mural, it's a work of art. The way they've um, done the shading on the, um, on the, the, the para's face, you can't see his eyes, but you can see his kit, and it's truly, truly exceptional. And the likeness that they captured of my great-grandfather is um, second to none. I, I mean, I literally could spend half an hour. And to my delight, the lady whose house it was um, just came along and I sort of spoke to her. 
because um, I was wondering about this thing about you know, um, painting people's houses, but she yeah. apparently delighted when they suggested the subject matter. And um, it was one of the, the many highlights of my visit was having a close up look at that because I, I can't begin to see how they, they got the, the shading right and the kit all true to form, the shrouds, the canopies, the detail is, is second to none, truly exceptional, extraordinary. So we encourage anyone in, in Belfast or in, in Northern Ireland to uh, get, get along to East Belfast and check that mural out. We, we'll put up some uh, photos of it on our uh, social media. Uh, but yeah, it is, um, as you said, it, it's a stunning work of art and definitely worth uh, checking out in, in person mm -hmm. to see the level of detail. The interesting um, thing is that the, um, the mural sort of got a black surround um, but they've made it such that um, the para is almost, um, he's, he's stepping out of the mural, so his foreleg is, is, is painted on the surround, and um, his, his face is actually quite haunting. You can't see his eyes, his eyes are shadowed, and um, I just, I've, I mean, I've seen it before, but seeing it up close was a completely different experience. Truly exceptional. And I, as you said there, I, I actually lived in that area. I lived four streets away from the mural at the time it was done. And it was done during a, a time of unease between okay. uh, the Polish and, and the local uh, community. And I do think it, it brought, um, it did bring people together. And it was part of a much wider, um, wider effort to kind of reconcile differences and, and enhance the similarities between uh, the two communities and I'd like to give a shout out to uh, an organization called For Your Freedom and Ours mm -hmm. um, who um, hosted yourself and last night and have done sort of many great events and um, educational projects um, around the uh, Polish involvement in the Second World War. Um, yeah, Maciek, so he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's a soldier in his own right, literally. Uh, proud of his heritage, making sure these things happen. I originally did this lecture online um, last year, and actually, funny enough, that start that was instrumental in me then doing it to an American audience of aviators, and um, and then for um, various other ones. The funny thing about COVID was it stopped us doing certain things, but allowed us to do other things. I never would have dreamt I could give my lecture to an exclusively American audience. Um, it's about two o'clock in the morning, I think. But anyway, so yes, Maciek really does require the plaudits because he's there working like a Trojan, making sure our heritage doesn't get forgotten. Because don't forget, the veterans are dying now. They've almost all died. And um, it's our duty to uh, ensure that young people know about this. And I did, did my lecture to a Polish school uh, in Slough, uh, west, west of London, yeah, uh, on Saturday. So these are 14 to 18 year olds. They're not interested. They're interested in TikTok and mobile phones. But you know what? They sat and they listened. And I think that's really important. And it's really heartening that they will remember. And somewhere down the line, I hope one of my um, children will pick up my laser pointer and then run with the lecture because um, it's really important. And just for the avoidance of doubt, every now and then I get some polls saying I'm trying to make a name of myself. I'm not. These are not my achievements. I'm merely the messenger. And I get doors open by virtue of my surname. So none of this is me, it's all to do with them. And you've mentioned your lecture a few times there. Um, if there are any groups out there, military history groups, or, or well, any, any group, any school really, um, who would like to hear your lecture, um, I, I heard it last night, it is, um, it's wonderful and it's definitely worth hearing the, the full lecture, not just a, a half hour podcast episode. How can people uh, find out more about those or how can people get in touch with you? They contact me at the University of Brighton. They can just Google Hal Sosabowski email and my email address ca comes up, but it's um, mhs at brighton.ac.uk. The cost is zero pounds and zero pence. It is my family duty and pleasure to give this lecture and it's far more of a pleasure than a duty. So I'm happy. You don't have to have a huge audience. If there's two people, the lecture happens. Let's get it out there. Let's talk about what the Poles did because we are free because of the sacrifices they made. I know it's a, it's a tired old meme, but it's absolutely the truth. And it's actually, I've been doing it for about 20 years now. And of course it grows. Every time I do it, someone tells me something I didn't know. So I incorporate it next time. And yesterday was no exception, I have to say. So um, it's you know 400 slides long with movies. It's worth hearing. 
And it's not for me to say that um, we, it captures the audience, but people sit through two hours of uh, daring do stories of Polish heroism. It is a fantastic family history to have and, and wonderful to have you um, continuing to tell those stories. Um, perhaps we'll have you back on the podcast again to talk more about um, the major and uh, the Warsaw Uprising um, as, as that story, as you said earlier, is, is often overlooked. But um, for now, thank you very much, Hal. Um, this has been a, a really great chat. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have too. And we hope to see you back in Northern Ireland again soon. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about my grandfather, my great grandfather, and for being so hospitable. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Paul Kelly, who is sitting uh, quietly in the background here of the uh, Ulster Reform Club. I'd like to thank them for letting us use their their lovely venue uh, for recording this morning. Again, I'd like to thank for your freedom and ours and everyone else who made this um, episode of the podcast happen. Subscribe to A Wee Bit of War on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your co-workers, break all the rules of the Official Secrets Act, and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast. Thank you for joining myself and Professor Hal Sosabowski. I look forward to your company again next time for another Wee Bit of War.